just control your calories if you want to lose the belly and train in the way that's going to produce the fastest muscle gain. I, I really just loathe this idea of treating exercise as something to keep us busy. Like, uh, it's like I, I've never in my life have I done sport for fun i don't know if i'm wide wrong or something like that but you know when you talk about basketball and that gives you that that competitive outlet like welcome to corporate warrior the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health optimize performance and maximize productivity with your host lawrence neal Hey guys, I am Lawrence Neal and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior. This is the podcast that teaches you how to optimize your health, exercise, business and lifestyle. My former guests include paleo pioneers Mark Sisson and Rob Wolf, zero carb carnivores like Dr. Sean Baker, high intensity strength training experts like Dr. Doug McGuff and Drew Bay, successful entrepreneurs like David Allen and Noah Kagan and many, many more. Are you a super busy CEO or senior executive looking for a way to get strong, fit and healthy in a time efficient way? Then look no further. This is a very targeted episode to show CEOs and busy execs why high intensity training is the perfect exercise regimen for their lifestyle. In this episode, I am joined by high-intensity personal trainer Gary Knight, who has built a successful personal training and online coaching business focused on helping CEOs get strong and ripped. We show you how to measure high-intensity training progress for optimal results, how to stimulate optimal gains with less than 30 minutes of exercise per week, how improving your health and strength will significantly boost your productivity in your career, and much, much more. For all of the show notes and links for this episode and all episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.org. Don't forget to hang around at the end of this episode for your free gift from me. And now I give you high intensity training for CEOs with Gary Knight. Gary, welcome back to the show, mate. Cheers, mate. Thanks for having me. <laughs> You're most welcome. So um, we got a bit excited recently because we recorded a podcast together, which should actually be out by the, well, you'd hope it would be out by the time this one's published, um, all about high intensity training and your experience as a trainer and diet and so on. And you had the idea of, you know, obviously we talked about um, training CEOs and training senior execs and how these people are so busy that this type of training is an ideal fit for their type of lifestyle and their goals. Um, hence, I guess, the reason we decided to arrange this episode. So, you know, what occurred to me when I was planning for this is why aren't more CEOs doing this? Why don't more CEOs know about this way of exercising? Well, I think, uh, like everything, HIT is already very, very niche. So, when when you spread a very strange idea like HIT th through the industry, you have to realize that there's fuck all practitioners of it. I mean, they're just they're scattered around in in much small small amounts. That how are they going to come across this information? So if you're a busy CEO, you're a busy executive. I mean, the last thing on your mind is is looking around for information about how to get your body in shape. You're a guy who basically makes their money, does their trade by building teams and outsourcing work. So you don't do work. You don't even learn processes in depth. You basically build excellent teams that solve complex problems for you and you just make decisions so when it comes to how a ceo looks at taking care of their body they're the they're not like us the nerdy guys that buy a heap of books and have time to pour through all the literature and make their mind up and weigh up the pros and cons they're just not interested they're the sort of guys that go what's the problem who's good at solving it they got a good reputation throw some money at them fix me so when a CEO is walking around, say, uh, the gyms in London, uh, they're, they're in some of the, the more affluent areas and they go into the gym, I mean, they, they're really just, if they're looking for a trainer, it's pretty much who's the, the biggest, prettiest guy around, getting a conversation with him and, and he kind of will accept what's in front of him if it's convincing enough or, or, or he won't. So when it comes to like, you know, pitching this to, to CEOs, I mean, I, I think in a lot of ways they just don't get the opportunity to have this idea in front of them. Um, and so they're just kind of like anyone else looking at PT, they're exposed to the mean. And unfortunately, the, the mean of, of personal trainers is, is very, very low. It's very low bar. The, the typical PTs, you know, basically producing a, a, a copy of a men's health workout at best. And 
you know, I see it all the time. Like I, I see other CEOs that, that aren't under my purview training with people with the worst methods imaginable, but they just kind of think they're taken care of and, and they come in with their pot bellies week in, week out, nothing changes, and that's kind of the end of it. But they, they don't really seem to care. So um, I think it's just bad luck that it's not available to them. I think that's fascinating because you think these guys are earning millions every year, a lot of them, and – that's such a waste of their time, such a waste. Like how much are they losing in terms of the money they could be making? And if they're not getting good results and potentially in some cases getting worse results, then it really is not a smart way to, to approach exercise. Absolutely. So usually when I t- sort of talk to CEOs, um, you know, one of the big things I always try, try to bring up is this idea of opportunity cost. And this, this really hits them um, right in their type of mindset. So they understand what it means to, to misallocate capital, to invest in the wrong process and what the consequences are. And they appreciate that kind of business language. So, so HIT in terms of like why should a CEO um, do HIT is because it, it really is the fast path to, to max out their genetic potential. I mean, every minute is accounted for. Every minute is productive there's nothing wasted we're not going to spend an hour with with fluff exercises crawling around on the gym doing all sorts of exotic nonsense it is get in do the thing that works do it really well and then get back on with the rest of your life so that's that's kind of why hit i think is the natural fit for a ceo but i mean it's whether they get the opportunity to see that or not it is a very hard hard thing to pull off big part of it is just chance isn't it like you're saying they they don't have enough time to to really think about this stuff and really be do their research and figure out you know what's a good pt from a bad pt what's a good exercise protocol from a bad one um and you know both you and i have been doing and preaching high intensity training for a long time um and those that that know this exercise protocol well will know that it's it's you know in terms of like a science-based protocol is probably the most effective exercise mode out there. Um, so let's talk about you know why you think it's a natural fit for CEOs. I guess we should kick off with maybe the fact that they're so focused on performance and measurement. So I might actually take a bit of a, a, a detour with, with my opinion sure. on this. So I, I like to think, and we like to think as, as HIT ag- advocates that we've got the smartest system out there. And because it's so smart, it's going to appeal to smart people. And I think there's some truth to that, but but human beings aren't always operating at, at like an analytical level. So much of these things are about kind of trait and personality. And and I like to think of HIT when, when I talk to CEOs about it is I'm actually introducing them to a really difficult game. And they're the sort of personality that likes to play hard games. They like to see clear pictures of what's the mountain or what's the peak I have to climb, um, how do I achieve high status. And in a sense, you're offering them something that's congruent with their personality. So every every aspect of their life is is usually tapped out with these guys. And, and the one thing that usually isn't, isn't congruent with that picture is, is their body because, I mean, they're working long hours. You put on one to two kilos of fat a year by the time you're in your 40s and you get your, your job as a CEO, you're, you're looking pretty bad to be honest you know you just dad bought it best um and that's it so what what i try to kind of do with these guys is explain to them that you know we, we, we do the analytical pitch but we, we we focus more on the fact that like l- listen this is the hardest game there is only hard men can play this game we're not doing short cheeky workouts to game ourselves and, and get away with hard work it, it's it's short because we're transmuting time by by working incredibly hard so so how i sort of frame it to them is is listen this this is for winners this is a winner's game this is for a really small percentage of personalities that can handle the workload here um you know when you do this session um i'm trying to break you i'm trying to 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 show you that it's it's either the hard path up the hill or don't come back to me you know what i mean so the the analytical pitch is kind of good but i think it really comes down to explaining to them that this is this is what hard men do and like if you're a winner you're going to choose this path. You're going to choose the path that's through, not around. So that's that's kind of how I, I really do think about it now. I just sort of go, listen, this is this is a this is a tricky, sophisticated game, but it's 
it's a lot of hard work, you know what I mean? This is this is for guys that are that are competitive, that are aggressive, that want to want to move fast through this process. They don't want to play around. Mm. Yeah, so you're kind of you're appealing to the ego, and I, I like that because the truth is is that high intensity strength training is probably the hardest form of exercise there is, uh, if done correctly. You know the the you're right if you were to perhaps frame it just from like you say a uh, practical point of view you know this is super time efficient this will get you the results you want that might work with some people but i have noticed that there are you know these sort of personality types do tend to uh if they do do exercise they do tend to um or sometimes tend to veer towards the kind of more uh not necessarily always smartest, but always very intense styles of exercise. So that makes sense to me. Yeah. So basically that's how I do tend to work it. So, um, I just pitch HIT as the winner's game. This is what hard men do. Um, this is how we go forward as fast as possible. Um, this is how we move in leaps and bounds. And then once you've kind of established all of that, you kind of, you're forcing them into a position where they have to kind of not retreat from, from that standard you've set. You've basically said, listen, you're a winner. This is the winner's game to choose anything other than this now becomes uh, an act of incongruency. So that, that's a really good way, way to sell, but it's, it's not really a sell because it's kind of a fact. I mean, once you've kind of established that, listen, this is the hardest thing you can possibly do to muscle tissue in the gym. It, it's very easy to get these guys to buy into it because their egos love it. They step up for challenges. So if, if you kind of like, if you, show the average person HIT, they tend to detest it, to be honest. And and one of the reasons, like, I, I have a lot of CEO clients now is is not really by design. It's it's that HIT has kind of filtered off the normies. Like, I'm kind of – I'm in this position where I'm like, God, I'm training a lot of guys with these high titles now. Like, what's going on? And, and I've realized that it's a stress test. So you can't climb to the top of a company unless you're incredibly ambitious, ego driven, status driven. You know what I mean? So all, all the qualities that you need to be um, successful at HIT training long range, I mean, they, they're, they're probably automatically built into these kind of guys. I mean, they just, they just got to kind of be shown that, listen, what you do um, in your everyday life is available here for you as an exercise modality. That's kind of, what's happening you know by by accident not so much design so um it's not it's not really like i mean people would sort of think oh you're targeting ceos because they're rich and they're going to train with you a long time and you'll make lots of money and i mean all that's true but i honestly most of the guys i have that are ceos uh, i've just stumbled across in front of them it's 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 this it's the the difficulty of the session itself selects for their personality type which i found really interesting and quite convenient to be honest do you want to um i guess we i know we have done a, a previous episode on defining high intensity training and i certainly link to that um for more context but do you want to just for i guess for the 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 guys listening and the you know the potential ceos and senior execs listening to this do you want to just talk through quickly what type of exercise protocol you put your clients through to get uh, maximum results yeah so so basically um you know the the average kind of guy i trains like 40 to 50 executive if not a ceo and and most of these guys i just go on twice a week um i mean you can obviously do once a week once a week's a very effective protocol but one of the things i, I like to talk about is full accounting and and i think if, if you don't do enough sessions a week it's very hard to get people to kind of lock it in as a lifestyle choice and a habit early on so so twice a week i think is a much better choice in terms of getting someone to buy into a process having those two moments with you a week where they can you know feel taken care of um play this really hard intense game um that's really important i think to to push for the twice a week three times a week is probably too much and and ceos don't have the time to be honest so um so two short kind of 20 to 30 minute workouts and i literally do five exercises a workout so there's 10 exercises a week covering the whole body 
one set each. And here's one of the things with, with all my, my CEO clients at the moment. They won't let me do warm-ups with them anymore. They literally come in, do one warm-up on the first exercise, and then we're just bam, 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 out of there in half an hour, you know what I mean, maybe even 20 minutes depending on how busy the gym is. So these guys – they love the efficiency of it. They absolutely they they they're so impressed with the novelty that they don't have to spend an hour messing about in the gym doing set after set, soft set after soft set, trying to sort of coax gains out of the body. They love that they can come in here last minute, in between a, a meeting or something like that, squeeze out a fast, effective workout. That's no compromise. So that's that's the the real beauty of it is that. You know, five exercises, five sets, 24 minutes, maybe a bit of chit-chat in between, blows it out to half an hour, and they're taken care of and they're out of there. So my approach is very minimalist, um, basic exercises, using a cadence and a rep range so that I can measure and move up the weight class appropriately, and that's pretty much in a nutshell. So I'm very bread and butter, and, and I, I tell everybody it's just hard work and progression. There's no way around it. Tell the truth, work hard, progress. There's no games. I don't do intensity techniques, which is is I know a lot of um, HOT practitioners absolutely love the idea of um, intensity techniques, but I just don't bother with it. Hey, one set, positive failure, measure it, make sure that that metric goes up each and every week without fail. So that's that's how I take care of a human body, and frankly, that's enough. That's all you need. Mm. Awesome. Um, one of the points you made here uh, when we were going back and forth was this this bullet points which said truth telling Marshall, which I, I got to be honest, I don't understand. What does what did you mean by that? Marshall reporting. Yeah. Okay. So basically, truth telling in the West has evolved from our military strategy. So this is this would require six hours of conversation to, okay. to fully elaborate. But Marshall reporting is basically. Truth-telling in the West evolved because our form of warfare was basically go to war, give a full account of what happened, develop military tactics based on, on reporting information about size of armies, tactics, all sorts of things like that. So when I say martial reporting, it's basically a, a fancy way of just saying tell the truth, tell it bluntly, um, don't put any spin or bullshit on it, just get to the facts. And so when I talk about things like cadence, go to failure, measuring what you do in a set that's really what we're doing it's just there's no fluff here you are fully exposed to how good you are or how bad you are in each workout um, and you have to kind of accept the consequences of it so that's sort of what martial reporting means so just yeah i think that's it's interesting because it's just so removed from i guess a lot of exercise routines that ceos will be doing already um and it's this is so congruent with their day-to-day -day life i mean they're all working to objectives to kpis and so this is going to make the most sense to them having set objectives objectives and then actually seeing the gains seeing the results in an objective manner is um is it's it baffles me why i guess you've already answered why it's not more widely used and widely practiced but it's such a perfect congruent fit um for ceos for sure um Shall, I, shall, I, shall we go through some of the devil's advocate kind of objections that I know they may have? Or do you want to talk a little bit more on why you feel HIT is a natural fit? Or do you think we've we've covered some of that? Um, we, I, I'd like to actually touch on that point sure. you just made about KPIs and metrics and things like that a little bit more. Yeah. So I think you're making a really, really good point about these guys. So they operate in a world, and, and coming back to this idea of martial reporting, they, they operate in a world where – you know, they have sales figures and sales teams and, and KPIs and, and hard metrics. And if someone, say, comes in, in to see them in a business meeting full of excuses and full of, you know, fancy language and things like that, they'll just kind of cut them down with, with simply like, what are your metrics? What are the numbers? How much capital you got? What's your returns? That They'll hit them with all these basic questions they know that just rip apart any kind of facade, bullshit, or excuse making. And it's really interesting because like most of what you see in a gym is like, it's fucking nonsense. Like it's literally, it doesn't make any sense. Nothing's tracked. It's really almost like animalistic you know what i mean it's like just watching sort of you know gorillas playing a playpen for, for the most part you know and so when you get these guys and kind of put this this 
this form of communication and targeting in front of them and, and metric tracking in front of them, it just marries up beautifully with everything they do as business people. They absolutely love it. And to be honest, the, the normal person I don't think really likes keeping metrics that much. I don't think the normal person really likes tracking that much because do you know what tracking means? It means accountability. It yeah. means pressure. It means you have to reach certain levels and you can't retreat from those levels. And a lot of people don't exercise for that. They're exercising just to relieve a little bit of stress, have a few endorphins flood through the body. They're not trying to to hit the upper echelons of what they're capable of. But but a guy that's a CEO, a guy that's an executive, an ambitious executive, oh, this guy's not wired the same as the normies, you know what I mean? He is about how do I get to the top? And he knows he can't get to the top unless he can hit numbers, you know what I mean? And he's looking for that arbitrage. He's looking for that window through, that advantage over his competitors. And that's another thing with CEOs. Oh, my God, these guys are so competitive. They're like 16-year-old schoolboys playing a game of basketball in front of the girls. They want to win. They want to beat people. So framing it in terms of like that, that idea of achieving dominance or dominance hierarchies is, is a natural fit for their personality. But the metrics and that analytical aspect that backs all of that process up is just as important but sort of you've got to start with the ego and then come through with with the more sort of blue thinking the more analytical thinking um so you know these guys they their lives are ruled by metrics and performance indicators um and i don't see why training should be any different you know what i mean Mm. you know if i'm a ceo listening to this how can you reassure me how this might improve my appearance or optimize my appearance, you know, cause I want my appearance to be congruent with the rest of my lifestyle. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, they, they're going to slap on muscle. Um, muscle always makes people look better and it'll happen quickly. The, the amount of these guys that like after six, seven weeks, every single one of these guys I train will come in and they're telling me a story about how their wife's noticed, you know, they've gotten bigger or someone who's not their wife's noticed they've gotten bigger. You know what I mean? There's always this one little story where somebody's noticed what's happened and the fact that it's happening, you know, like five, six weeks later, um, it, it just backs up everything you said when you first met them and said what you could do for them. So, so this kind of training, I mean, it just works. You, you are going to be, you're going to have the biggest arm in the golf shirt, uh, in the, in the polo shirt on the golf course, you know, and, and in an appreciable amount of time. Um, that doesn't mean that there's miracles, but, you know, six to nine months, I should be able to milk out your peak level of musculature. Um, when it comes to, to maybe like belly fat and things like that, we have to go into diet. Um, but again, my approach is much the same where we just focus on the main metrics, calories in, calories out, maybe macros if we need to, um, and, and see the process through and math it out because the, this is what I'm about. Math's not drama, you know what I mean? So um, it can happen really, really quickly. But doesn't exercise burn fat, Gary? <laughs> well, not really. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you read you read these weird studies about how they compared people that that do like an hour of of moderate intensity exercise every single day versus someone who does nothing, and they look at the calorie burn over the twenty four hour window, and it's exactly the same. And that's really disheartening because you just think there's people like smashing the treadmills, you know, all the time in the gym, and they're not in the best shape. Um, so it, you really do need to, to have a calorie deficit long range and you, you also need to muscle up. You got to have muscle tissue. That's, that's really the engine of change in the body. So there's no, there's no way of getting around that. So, I mean, these guys, they have the personality and the temperament to play this game really hard and really well. There, there are a few drawbacks to, to their environment, but that can hurt them when it comes to lifestyle. So they often have to, to do a lot of dinners and events and things like that where they're exposed to um, food. But listen, I, I've had clients where they, um, and, and they won't mind me telling, telling this live, where they've, they've had several glasses of Prosecco and they've passed their meal on to their mate because they knew that they'd hit their calorie limit already. So this is like the hilarious thing. They're coming into you like two days later going, yeah, I went to this charity dinner and I maxed out my credit card, but you'll be happy to know that I only had, uh, you know, 1400 calories of Prosecco. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> fucking extraordinary. And obviously you got to dress them down a, a little bit and be like, well, let's, let's not make that a standard thing. You know what I mean? We, we can't have all our macros be pure 
or alcohol. Um, but but these things do happen, and and you can appreciate that they f- stick to the rules. You know what I mean? You set out the rules, you set out the targets, and and they'll hit them even if they've been a little bit cheeky when it comes to to how they game themselves on that particular night. So as long as they can kind of um, make the step. Um, to, to, to make some big changes in their lifestyle. They can have everything. Um, but that kind of – I don't think that's so much – like it is their responsibility, but I think it's your job as a trainer to be so good at what you do, to be so good at understanding the person in front of you that you can can elevate their interest in what you do. So I don't think people are walking around being interested in being great shape, in great shape all the time or in great health. They have it as kind of like an amorphous concern. But if they've come into you in, 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 in average shape or with a dad bod, I mean, they don't care that much. And your job as a trainer is to get them interested in this game, get them interested in this process. So as a coach, I think the difference between, say, being a personal trainer versus being a coach is is really understanding that if you teach people this game, they get interested in it. It's not the other way around. They're not interested in it looking for a solution. You have to teach them this exciting game that's full of possibilities that can move them from A to B, and then that's when the switch happens. So that's that's part of being a good coach, I think, is 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 educating and illuminating and getting people interrupted from their pattern to try a new way of kind of existing. How, how do you gamify it? Do you do that by giving them targets in terms of reps and weight and stuff like that? Yeah, I'm, I'm basically viciously manipulative. So um, when it comes to CEO guys and, and higher executives, I won't do this with the, the normie clients, but to be honest, I don't really have many normie clients left, to be honest. They're all the, – the means just keeps get, getting higher and higher for me, which is good because it means I can just – to be honest, be myself with these these guys. I'm a very disagreeable guy. It's my way or nothing, um, and I, I tend to just want to impose my view of the world on people. And I, <laughs> I, I, I well, it, it is funny, but I, I I find these these guys kind of like it. I think it resonates with them. I think they're like me within their domain. So when they come across this this person that's so hard and aggressive about how, how they deliver these sessions, they just kind of go, yeah, that's, I'm an asshole at work. Why wouldn't this guy be an asshole at work? So it just, it's kind of like a natural fit. I don't know. I don't know whether that's a, a compliment or a criticism or a bit of both, but it seems to work for everyone involved. Um, so, so basically, um, okay, where were we? I Game, got side gamifying. Track. Yeah. So gamifying. So basically uh, you, you set it up as a game. So, the first thing I kind of do within a comp session or, or early on is is just compare them with myself. So because I track for cadence, um, the weight lifted and the rep range, it's very easy to say, listen, I do this workout. I do it exactly at the same speed you do it and the same range of motion. And these are my numbers. Look, they're double and a half yours at the moment. And that's really good for these guys because they don't like to be losers. They are used to sitting at the top. So you immediately have come in with this this pitch or, or this frame where you've said, look, you're at the bottom of the game, bruv. You're at the bottom of the hill. I'm at the top. You know what I mean? I'm the strongest and I'm goading them to catch me. If you do this with a normal person, they'll fucking hate you. You will not get their business. They will think you're an absolute fucking dick. You do this with a CEO, they'll be your best mate it's like it's it's so strange so one of the things when i was preparing for this show in the last couple of weeks talking to the wife i was just kind of the more i wrote the more notes i wrote i just realized that the best thing i can do with ceos is be like just unashamedly myself just be highly disagreeable push what you do and force it on them and and they love it so i established the game in the sense that i'm at the top I can do these numbers on the chest press and the pull down and the leg press. You're miles away from me, but you can catch me. And I actually have metrics on how fast it takes to catch me from like an average starting point. So say something like a reverse grip pull down, I'm doing sort of 85, 90 kilos, 6 to 10 reps with a 4-4 cadence, 4-2-4 cadence, and and they will start somewhere around 40 kilos. So if you math that out in a 6 to 10 rep range, increasing one rep every single week, they're 66 weeks away from me. So immediately I 
put everything into maths, not not drama. I, I give them something that they can chase down. And what happens is usually like we'll have a session two or three weeks into it and they'll go, oh, I went up three reps this week or I went up two reps this week. I'm only 32 weeks away. They're into it. They love the chase. So you are setting this golden standard. You're setting a dominance hierarchy. You're putting yourself as their coach at the top of it and they're, and you tell them, come after me. I fucking dare you. I dare you to play this game. This is a hard game. You know what I mean? And then the other thing I do is, um, and it kind of happened by accident, but now I've mapped it out across the entire clientele list is, is one of my CEOs and one of my high end executives, uh, work in industries that where they compete against each other and they know each other. Um, and so they kind of ask about, Oh, how's old mate going? You know, what's his numbers on this? (laughs) And I just thought, fuck it, I'm going to get out the log sheet. And I just said, yeah, he's hitting this, this, and this. And, oh, my God, the response is amazing. It's the competitive streak that comes out in these guys. And they're wired for it. They're they're in this position because they are competitive. And it's almost childish how competitive they are. But I think it's a really good thing. So it may, may be talking off topic about success is be childish about competition. Be simple and childish about competition if you want to achieve something in this world because there's nothing like just chasing after something simply instead of making up all these excuses why you can't and why money's not important and why success isn't important and the meaning of life is to be happy. These guys don't fucking think like that. They go, there's a hierarchy and I climb hierarchies because when I climb hierarchies, I've done the work and I'm at the top, and I want to be at the top. So part of gamifying all of this is you're competing with me, your coach, and I'm arrogant about my numbers. I'll just, you know, I'll spit out them big numbers on them and be like, catch me, like, <laughs> without any issue. And normally, if I did that on a normal person, would not work. They love it. And then across, across the domain, neck and neck, here's your buddy. He's catching you. He's ahead of you. I've got another guy that's doing this. And what was really interesting is, one of the few female clients I have, um, she actually has a wonderful competitive streak in her and, and she's actually quite high up professionally too. Um, but she, I had this conversation with her about how I manipulate all the other boys, how I manipulate the boys club with numbers and tell them each other's log sheets. And she's like, I want to beat the boys. And I was just like, oh, my God, like it's just amazing. So competition um, amongst certain groups of people that, that are in competitive environments, oh, it, it makes this thing fun, hey. It makes this thing meaningful. It makes them buy into it long range, you know what I mean? There's something to win. There's a prize to win. And I think that's, I think that's the best way – you can frame HIT like it almost doesn't matter who you're dealing with. It's, it's, it works very well with these guys, but I mean, seeing it as a competition of you versus you, you versus others, you versus me, the coach, all these things really push competitive high end people to, to really go for it and buy into this process. And now it's time for a quick break. Join me this year on the 9th and 10th of March 2018 at the Resistance Exercise Conference, the science and application of strength training for health and human performance. We are going to be joined by some amazing speakers, including former head strength and conditioning coach for the University of Michigan, Mike Giddelson. A pioneer in the field, Mike spent 30 seasons as the head strength and conditioning coach for the University of Michigan's football program. Giddelson was recognized by the Professional Football Strength and Conditioning Coaches Society as a 2003 National Collegiate Football Strength and Conditioning Coach of the Year. An adjunct lecturer in sports management and communication for the Division of Kinesiology, Giddelson was honored with the distinction of becoming an honorary M-Man in 1997. To get 10% off your entry fee, head on over to resistanceexerciseconference.com and enter the coupon code CORPORATEWARRIOR10 in PayPal. So again, head on over to resistanceexerciseconference.com and get 10% off using CORPORATEWARRIOR10 in PayPal and I look forward to meeting you in person. Now back to the show. I know we're talking about your approach to appealing to the psychology of the CEO in terms of, because that's ultimately the goal because... Well, the goal is ultimately to get them to um, 
adhere to the to the to the training and to do it and to come back week after week and and that's the goal not necessarily convincing them that this is going to be so helpful and beneficial for them because as we've already talked about that as actually is probably not the most effective way to motivate some of these guys mm-hmm. um that being said though you know i mean i'm i'm in literally the next half hour um i'm off to deliver a speech um to a small audience on the benefits of high intensity training so i will be talking about the vast number of benefits i won't even be able to cover them all because there's just so many in terms of like strength and muscle mass and metabolism and bone mineral density and, and everything else do you kind of drip feed this information to your clients as you go do you like talk to them about it is it important do you think to talk about it how do you think about that and approach that yeah, so w- when we do sort of the part two to to this show, we'll probably cover things like like how to pitch and stuff like that, and and, and I sort of go into a little bit of neuroscience talking talking about how how the brain's wired up in terms of crop brain, mid brain, um, and, and the neocortex and and how you frame certain things and in what what order you frame certain arguments and pitches is is really important for kind of getting the message home. Um, but when it comes to sort of what you, what you described to me then is what I would call like an analytical frame. So you're trying to talk about health benefits, about metrics, what it means to be healthy, how to become healthy. You're making the sort of the more intelligent thinking person's pitch. And, and that's, that is really, really effective. And it works. Most of the guys who are say into HIT, as maybe fans as opposed to, to practitioners or businessmen will be those kind of personalities. They're, they're a little bit nerdy, a little bit aspy. They love processes. They, they love intelligent solutions to things. And that works really, really well for them. So that is usually something that comes midway through a pitch, not really at the start. I tend, if, I, if I've had a conversation with them and determined, that they're in a certain industry, they sit in a certain position, I usually open with something more aggressive that's ego-based. But I think with the average person, it's the, the analytical frame is a, is a, is a, is a perfectly good one. Um, so I, I do give a speech about what does it mean to be healthy. And so I basically frame it in terms of like health is about lean muscle mass. So muscle mass is basically where all the metabolic adaptions take place that are going to keep you fit and healthy long range and build capacity so that you can move properly during the course of your life. Um, And being lean is really important because if you have X amount of belly fat, if your waist is over X amount of inches, um, we know from all our studies that you're exposed to a whole swath of lifestyle diseases. So if you can pull those big levers of, of slapping on some muscle mass so that you have capacity and, and metabolic adaptions that, that make you youthful and youthful long range. Awesome. Um, and if we can keep the fat low, it doesn't have to be shredded, but if we can have you a, a roughly a flat stomach, all of those uh, lifestyle factors of lifestyle disease are, are vastly reduced. So that's what you would call an analytical frame um, or something like that. So, yeah, I mean, that that is a big part of what I do. And I used to do it a lot more. I, it used to be kind of at the forefront but as my clientele's changed i've realized that that often it's it's dealing with ego is 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 a much better way to open if that makes sense it does yeah because i'm thinking for myself you know i was obviously in b2b tech sales in london for almost 10 years and i was i'm definitely of that personality type like i am incredibly competitive um it's one of the reasons why i miss basketball so much lately because i I can't remember if I told you this, but I injured my calf, mm-hmm. pulled my calf muscle and uh, been out of that for a bit. And uh, that's kind of where I really practice that competitive edge because in my own business, I, I I don't have – it's not – the competition isn't as quite as tangible as it was when I was uh, in, in tech sales. But no, I can – if I were training in London, I mean, I've said this, this to you before, like I would definitely opt to train with you because that type of approach would really appeal to me because it's far more optimistic and fun, you know, mm. if you're trying to reach goals and better yourself every time and rather than follow some kind of arbitrary exercise measurement. Um, but, you know, I want to address, I guess, some of the questions that I think CEOs listening to this will have in terms of, you know, um, potential concerns or objections. Um, what about cardio? 
Yeah, so usually, um, usually I open a conversation with with, with these guys and mo- most comp sessions and things like that with with what's called like an intrigue frame. So what what I'm trying to do is is basically separate myself from the pack really aggressively and kind of have a really different, unique approach so that I can kind of get their attention and get them listening, get them open to the message that they're, they're, that I'm about to deliver. Um, so, so cardio is, is a really, really good thing to talk about. Um, often they'll ask it directly when you sort of make the pitch about muscle, they'll make the objection and, and oh, what about cardio? And I'll just say, listen, it's, it's sort of a bit cheeky, but there's not really such a thing as cardio. And if I could kind of frame it like this, the only way to train a body is to contract muscle tissue. And unfortunately, we, we live in a world where the industry has come up with all these creative modalities to move. It's all about different movement patterns of different variations of intensity and duration and, and sets and reps and all sorts of things that kind of are designed to appeal to people's bias or, or how they like to see themselves. My approach is, is very back to basics. It's you can contract a mu- muscle fiber hard or soft, and it just so happens that when we contract tra- these puppies hard to the point of failure, we, we induce all of the changes we need to make to, to maximize all of those kind of health metrics um, and metabolic adaptations. So the idea that spending time contracting muscle fiber softly for long periods of time is, is going to be more beneficial than really, really hard, intense work is, is a really nonsense argument to make. So you're basically saying that if I hop on the tr- – and I'll say this. I'll say, listen, you're basically saying that if we go hop on the treadmill and, and walk for the next hour, we're going to ma- magically massage the heart and lungs and, and induce some benefit that we wouldn't get from working really, really hard. And once you kind of frame it like that, they're like, oh, yeah. That makes sense. And, and then I sort of say to them, and when you think about it, could you imagine anything other than hard work being the solution to maximizing your health? Like, like could you really imagine deliberately choosing to hold back, go soft, and do a low intensity activity is going to produce some kind of magical change or benefit to the body? You know what I mean? We are, we are beasts of locomotion. We move to survive. And our muscle tissue is how we do it. So everything that, that's really good for the body tends to be wrapped up in the muscle tissue. Yeah, that's good. I, it's, it's interesting. I always, I'm always interested to hear how um, HIT trainers um, talk about cardio because people come from a, a background where they believe the two to be separate. They believe cardio to be separate from strength training when they're one of the same thing. Um, mm-hmm. I like the the way of articulating it where you say, you know, the cardiovascular system is there to serve the muscles, the heart mm. and lungs serve the muscles and the body doesn't know the difference between running up a hill and pushing a leg press. You know, it doesn't know that you're doing a different activity. It's not like it switches on cardio, but it does the hill, hill run. Um, and when you, yeah, when you say that to people, it's like they ha- you s- I love it when you see them have like an epiphany for the first mm. time on stuff like that, because no one's ever probably described it like that to them. Yeah. Um, and I always think of Doug McGuff as being really the master at articulating this stuff in the most simple way. And I just um, steal his. Mm. <laughs> what were you going to say? His book is just – it is breathtaking in terms of a, of a tool to to help communicate what we do. He, he really did make it possible for us to have a, a scientific or truthful way of communicating it. Like, like Mensa was really good, I think, with like principles and the game plan, but what Doug did is, is such a boon for trainers um, like myself. You know what I mean? I, I, so much of Doug's chapters are wrapped up in my pitch, you, you would not believe it. <laughs> same same with me and uh no I, I i i don't blame you um okay so what about high intensity interval training <sighs> why like i'm i'm a i'm a do the one thing guy you know what i mean i'm just like just control your calories if you want to lose the belly and train in the way that's going to produce the fastest muscle gain i i really just loathe this idea of treating exercise as something to keep us busy like uh, it's like I, I've never in my life have I done sport for fun. I don't know if I'm wired wrong or something like that. But you know when you talk about basketball and that gives you that that competitive outlet. Like like when I played basketball, you know I, I did quite well as a young fella in, in in the high school years. And basically, I would have to win not to feel depressed. Like I wouldn't even get a high out of it. It was basically like you would have to win 
not to hate your existence. Um, and, <laughs> like, like, so, so I, I can relate I, to that. Yeah. Like that's how, I, that's how I am. So, um, like I grew up on the beach doing lots of beach sports and training in the ocean, in the water. And I literally don't go to the beach for fun. Like when people talk about casually going to the beach, I'm like, you what? Like the beach was just a gym when I had a different exercise modality. It is not a place of fun. I don't know, like if I'm wired wrong or something, but that that's how it is. And I, I tend to try to find clients that kind of buy into that that view of the world that we come here once or twice, maybe three times a week, and we do something that's the most effective thing possible. And if you want to do some exercise on the side just to kind of clear your head. Um, elevate your mood just go for a walk in the park go play with the kids walk the dog go, get out in nature go see something that that kind of you know tickles the senses a little bit get some sunlight so i'm big on advocating like walking i think people should like be you know we have so many beautiful parks in london i'm just like you know go to the common go to battersea park like go 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 out in nature and do something or go hike up a hill don't go don't hop on a treadmill and do intervals it's just it's like if anything, it's just going to make you hungry and you're going to overeat. Like, it's just not worth it. And it tends to just interrupt the rest of the training anyway. Um, I'm curious to get your opinion on this because I think I think high-intensity interval training is certainly more well-known um, than high-intensity strength training, which is what we've been talking about. Um, yep. And I think that a lot of that's come from the, the research that was probably um, well-distributed in the media about how high-intensity interval training was shown to be as effective as steady state with much yep. more volume. So they did... Um, quick quick summary they did they had two groups one do steady state one do very brief high intensity interval training you know that the, the former group were doing you know four or five plus runs a week and the other group were doing like six minutes of exercise a week and they both had the same outcomes um, <laughs> and that was obviously really really compelling and that's great and it's certainly a step in the right direction now my concern of high intensity interval training if that's all someone does is let's say they're doing that on a bike or they're sprinting yes they're going to probably get some lower body muscle gain some lower body hypertrophy and mm-hmm. yes they will get improvements in their cardiovascular conditioning uh, and their overall health but they're not going to get that overall stimulus to the whole musculature which is what we're talking about and that's the way i see it that's where i see it kind of being a lesser modality in that sense yeah i mean absolutely i mean it's not the first time the scientific community can't see the forest or the trees so they they tend to I don't know what it is, but it seems like a lot of people in exercise physiology departments just don't get it. Like they just, they're comparing people's choices against other choices instead of investigating the nature of the body and, and, and how to, I guess, run it most optimally. And, and those studies with, with HIIT, um, versus steady state, I mean, they're, they're arguing everything we argue, but they're just, they're just like not joining the dots. They're not following the rabbit hole, you know, fully swallowing the red pill on the issue. Um, so what makes HIIT so effective is, is that the intensity is raised. And, and what it means to raise intensity is, is if you look at it mechanically, you're accessing higher thresholds of motor units. That's what makes it time efficient. So because you're using speed and a little bit of resistance on the bike as a, as a proxy for overload, you're, you're able to, to move through slow, medium and fast twitch fibers and that's what gives you all those metabolic adaptations. And so what makes HIT so effective is essentially we just do that for every fiber in the body, but we do it smarter, more calculable. Um, we cover the whole body and we do it in a safer way because we're not using speed to, to grind up the joints and the ligaments and the connective tissues. So moving slow and safely, going to our limits, triggering all of the available type fiber types so that they're all induced into some kind of change or metabolic adaptation that, that produces a healthier organism. Um, and that's kind of it in a nutshell. So like I love that study because it's a good segue for us because I think a lot of people know that argument. I think a lot of the general population have seen the um, – yeah seen that english guy that that did the um study he yeah, Mike Her- something. yeah i can't remember his last name but um on horizon wasn't it the bbc yeah, program and yeah and it, and it went everywhere it was quite well known i remember seeing yeah, it. it's called the truth about exercise i can link to that yeah it, exactly um but so people kind of think this idea of, of doing you know 10 sprints is better than doing you know 45 minutes of cardio well 
how about we do five sprints slow and controlled with heavy weights across the body? That's like, that's the leap. And, and full accounting is on our side because what we're saying is we can actually maximize um, or, or minimize actually the risk to your joint health. That's the big problem when you start to whip things with speed. You just, you're playing it, uh, you're rolling the dice a little bit when it comes to joint health. So I, I really do love those studies because we can just, we can piggyback off, off them very, very easily actually yeah i agree um is high intensity training enough i mean you've talked a little about this already but i don't know if you want to elaborate on that yeah of course it is but i would say i mean there's there's so many aspects to health right so it's not just about having jack muscles and and not having belly fat um i mean mental health is really important psychological health you know trying to be happy um, and I, I'm not of this view that you can be happy all the time. We seem to have this really kind of demanding, ungrateful millennial attitude these days where we're expected to be like like joyously happy all the time. And I think that's pretty unrealistic. But I think a big, big part of exercise is – you know, it, it needs to be technically true, but you need to, you do need to enjoy it somewhat, you know, and that's why I have to turn it into a game because it's so hard that if you didn't love the game, you're not going to stick it at long range. And it tends to be why I operate now with a certain group of people that, that kind of, um, can handle it. I think the average person wouldn't be happy doing HOT. And that, that might be like a really radical thing to say, but I've, I've sort of said before in the previous show that, I don't think it is for normies. I don't think our job as HIT advocates is to convince the world to do what we do. I think it's just to find the people it resonates with and help them. Um, because I, you know, even the other day, like I did a full body workout the other day, Lawrence, and my God, I felt depressed for two days. That thing just, it just annihilated me. And I, and then I just, I kept thinking about all my clients and I'm like, you guys are psychopaths. You must be absolutely psychotic to spend six months of this shit with me. Like, what is wrong with these people? <laughs> it's, it's, it's that fucking hard. Like, um, and, and then, then when, when those kind of moments strike you, you, you realize, how foolish you were in your younger years trying to preach HIT to too broad an audience. You realize just you were pushing shit up a hill, trying to convince your best mate to come to the gym with you and do this style of training because they're just not wired for it. The, the, the human brain hates that kind of hard work, you know what I mean? So I think HIT is for a small group of people that can handle high stress, that love metrics, love accountability. I think it's a proxy IQ test. It's a proxy temperament test, as elitist as that sounds. But I can tell you right now, if someone's smart and in a leadership position, it's, it's just I know they're going to take PT with me. This is interesting for because I, I, I do I do think I agree with you is that it is I think too many people get obsessed with this is how everyone should be exercising but mm. in reality it's just not going to um, resonate with certain people certain populations you know I've had people say to me having okay so I will caveat this by saying they haven't necessarily been trained by a HIT personal trainer which I think makes a big difference uh, but let's say they've listened to me or they've read Body by Science and they've gone and tried to practice it. Um, they have tried it and then they've told me, oh, no, I went back to doing my other thing, which is like high volume multi-set type of thing, mm. uh, which is likely to be, well, by definition, has to be less intense um, because I wouldn't be able to handle the, the load. And I had another friend of mine who, you know, he says, if I have en- if I have enough time, I will do a more conventional high volume multi-set workout. But if I don't, I'll do HIT. So he does acknowledge the benefits, but he's also... It's funny because he said, you know, it's just so damn hard, man. Like, it's so hard. Like, I would opt for the easier approach sometimes. And that was like, ah, okay. That was a bit interesting because sometimes it's so – when you're so – when you're an outlier like you and I, like, we love high-intensity training, you forget other perspectives and where other people are coming from. So, no, I I totally agree with with what you're saying on that. Um, Okay, so – how do how do the CEOs you know how do these guys find trainers okay so basically like here's the sad thing right i don't think there's a lot of ceos um looking around that often they they usually sign up to the gym um they'll get a comp session it'll be handed to them at random and if they like the process they'll probably go with the trainer or if they like the trainer they'll, they'll consider it or he's a good salesman he'll convince him of it so uh, 
I would like to say let's let's take responsibility as trainers and, and advocates of HRT to like be better at marketing, be better at sales, be better at finding ways to reach these guys so that you can help them. You know what I mean? Because they they're going to love what you do. You know what I mean? They're absolutely. It is such an experience to have a proper supervised HIT workout. It is such an awesome journey to go on, on six to nine months of this stuff and just watch what you can do. It's a, it's a fun game for, for high-stakes players. Um, so, I mean, if anyone does get to listen to this and they're interested in HIT and their executives, I mean – you know where to call all the links will be in the blog notes and things like that but we are few and far between so um you sometimes just need to like i mean often people that say come to london i mean people will get recommended to me like like simon shawcross will sort of give me an email every now and then and say yeah i've got someone coming in um I know you're there, look me up and they'll get into contact and we'll go from there. But that, that's a pretty rare event and that's not necessarily a CEO. It's usually someone who's already a client of a HIT trainer in Australia or somewhere else and they've come to town and, and then they look you up. Um, so basically it's our job to, to sort of get shows like this uh, in front of the right people so, um, so that they can contact us and, and hook something up basically. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're out there, you know what I mean. Every, every capital city has got one to four, <laughs> one to four people that do HOT. Hopefully, one's in the city. Hopefully, one's close to the city for you. Um, but it's it's worth having a go, having a try. You know what I mean. So, um, but I I think the ownership and the responsibilities on us as as, as business people, um, if we want to spread this, if we want to help people and and help people. Um, in these kind of positions we we have to be better marketers we have to find ways to get in front of them you know what i mean mm. yeah I, I agree and um, i would just say that if you're listening to this in the u.s and you're in the u.s i should say um i would say there's a far greater number of high quality trainers there and uh, especially in the kind of more uh well-known cities you should be able to find a high intensity trainer there in the uk not quite the same situation there's probably a handful of guys in the uk who actually know what they're talking about uh, and i pretty much or gary and i know pretty much all of those guys so <laughs> um so it's a bit of a challenge but obviously you know if you're interested in finding a trainer feel free to contact gary or i uh you can find obviously the the contact details for me on the website and uh you know, gary's contact details will be in the show notes um, and we can try and help point you in the right direction um but gary what about like you know, I'm kind of pondering this as you're talking, like it is, it is quite hard for certain people. And we've already talked about, you know, the aversion that I guess a lot of people have to, to discovering the, the benefits of high intensity training, but like, how hard is it to, to expect someone to self-administer this, to, to say to someone, Hey, buy body by science, read the book and then just do it. Cause that's what I did, but I'm an outlier, you know? You are a huge outlier. Right. You know what I mean. I mean, I, I had I had the Mensa book, right? High intensity training the Mike Mensa way. I had that in my hands as a fourteen year old. I couldn't see what it was. It just, I just was going to copy Arnold Schwarzenegger. It just didn't <laughs> didn't matter what the fuck happened. I'm going to copy Arnold Schwarzenegger because his mustache wasn't so ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that that was kind of kind of the end of it. And it, it took me. I had I had to get smarter. I had to read more. I had to get more versed in philosophy and science, and 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 have a problem to solve, which was my beginner gains are tapped. You're not growing anymore on on these protocols. Who's got an answer? That was the uh, that was the crisis moment in which I, I I sought out different solutions and came across or revisited Mensa and went down the rabbit hole again. Um, so I mean, it, it is. <sighs> Like I'm of the honest belief that if you train with me, I guarantee the strength in- increases. I'm 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 going to arrogantly say I'm an expert in what I do. I know how to make you push to your peak performance every single time without failure. Give me six to nine months, and you're going to be fucking happy, and you're going to be fucking impressed with yourself. And I honestly think most people can't self-administer it. You know what I mean? I, which is kind of sad, but. Um, I think I think the human brain just wants to cut out before these levels of pain, levels of difficulty. It is designed to avoid this sort of shit. So our job as trainers is really to kind of turn this whole thing into a game, to be excellent coaches, to be on top of people, to, to be tracking metrics from which they cannot retreat, to, to kind of 
teach them how to play the game properly and to change their psychology or, or reinforce their psychology in this new domain. So I some people just can't help competition, you know what I mean? Like you, you would probably know from your basketball days. Um, I mean, obviously, as you, as you get up the ranks, usually everyone around you is really good, but there's always the bench players, you know what I mean? And they don't fucking hustle. They can't catch the ball when you throw it at them hard. And then there's guys that you can just hurl the thing at them 100 miles an hour and you know they're going to pluck it out of the sky and, and, and dunk the thing for you. You know what I mean? You just you know you know the A players and the B players. And, and as elitist as that sounds, unfortunately, that's how the world is wired. So I don't think our job as HIT trainers – I mean – you meet someone, they ask you a question, introduce them to it, show them what you do with, with, with full effort and attention and support um, to, to try and show them how it can help them. But don't get upset just because a human being doesn't like to work really fucking hard because they're not wired that way, you know what I mean? There's a reason that, you know, we have Pareto expressions of wealth, you know what I mean? It's it's because certain behaviours and characteristics are, are small in concentration and HIT, I think, is one of those that, that appeals to people with that kind of mindset. Yeah, I, I fully agree, to be honest with you. I think that, you know, a lot of the people that come across my podcast or do self-administer hit, they're like you and me. You know, they just didn't know about mm. it before. <laughs> as soon as they know about it, they're like, well, I've already wired to do this, so I'm going to do it, you know? Exactly. Um, awesome. Okay, well, uh, anything else you want to add? Oh, uh, what's the best way for people to find out more about you, Gary, and get in touch with you if they're interested in your services? Oh, I should have sent you an email, Lawrence. You can be my secretary. <laughs> um, no, they can get get to me on Facebook. That's the best way. Find me on Facebook, but we'll we'll put some links. I think in yeah. the show notes anyway. Phone number and things like that. But uh, email me, um, intensegainsgary at gmail dot com. So that's Gary with a single R. So intense gains, as in muscle gains, Gary with an S, isn't it? not as yeah, with an S, with an S, exactly. <laughs> um, not one of those idiots. <laughs> The, the, the queen i might be an australian but i speak the queen's english um cool but yeah so that's that's pretty easy and and to be honest like going forward in this space with ceos and things like that i'll, I'll probably be building out products where i'll try to be a bit more mobile and look at sort of coming to them um but obviously i, I have to charge charge a small fortune to kind of make that a possibility but uh, these are the kind of people I, I want to work with. So when we talk about that problem of there's not enough HIT trainers and they're not geographically spread, um, I want to think about the fact that, well, if you're working with guys that have the means to, to afford um, certain luxuries, um, we can as HIT trainers um, build things out for them. So that's kind of what I'll do going forward is, is basically build a model um where I can scalp you for a fair bit of cash, but it enables me to be free to come to you and, and offer something really bespoke and concentrated in terms of teaching you what to do. Um, so I think that's I think that's the solution for how to help CEOs, but also how to get HIT, um, take it to the person instead of always relying on luck, you know what I mean, just on that convenience of, of our geographies lining up at the right period of time, you know what I mean. It's, it's so funny how how we can miss helping so many people just by these tiny margins of error. You know what I mean? So I think, yeah, something, something more mobile, more bespoke so that we can get HIT helping the right people is, is definitely the way forward. Awesome. And uh, as we've been as we've been mentioning throughout this, um, if you want to review the blog post for this episode and all of the links, resources that Gary and I mentioned, as well as his contact details, uh, please go to corporatewarrior.org, and on there you'll find a list of all the episodes. And until next time, guys, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Before you head off, head on over to corpwarrior.com, that's C-O-R-P warrior.com, to get your free high-intensity training Google progress chart, an ebook with six interview transcripts of some of my top guests, including Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay, and Bill A. Simone on how to optimize muscle gain, fat loss, and overall health in an efficient, effective, and sustainable way. These transcripts are deliberately not verbatim. Instead, they've been transcribed in an easy Easy read format to make it more enjoyable and easier for you to quickly pick out what you need and start getting results. To get your ebook, head on over to corpwarrior.com, enter your email address, then check your email for an email from me with a confirmation link. Once you click the link, you will be instantly redirected to a PDF version of the transcripts. 
This episode is brought to you by the Resistance Exercise Conference, the science and application of strength training for health and human performance. Would you like to learn from the top strength training researchers, network and connect with other exercise professionals from all over the world, join a welcome reception on a Friday night to build relationships with other strength training professionals, experience an early morning workout from an expert trainer to kickstart your Saturday, and get inspired, rejuvenated, and focused on your strength training business? I certainly do, and that is why I am attending and interviewing all of the speakers at the event. The Resistance Exercise Conference will be held on the 9th and 10th of March 2018 in Minneapolis, Minnesota at the Commons Hotel. To get 10% off your entry fee, head on over to resistanceexerciseconference.com, click the registration button, and enter Corporate Warrior 10 in the promo code field in PayPal. I'm very excited about this and I've wanted to attend for years. Sign up now at resistanceexerciseconference.com and get 10% off with promo code CORPORATE WARRIOR 10 and I look forward to meeting you in person.